Yeah, first of all, I want to thank Spencer Hess for his series on the PMC. I hope you had a chance to watch that series. If not, I will put a link to the playlist below. Um, but as promised, I wanted to go ahead and begin my series on Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian War, and Thucydidean Realism. Uh, as I said before, this is a subject that I know quite a bit about because I not only wrote my dissertation on the subject, but I went on to publish that and numerous chapters and not a small number of articles on the topic of Thucydides and international relations. And actually, the book that I wrote um, is entitled Thucydides, Hobbes, and the Interpretation of Realism, and it's been reprinted in the past year or so by um, Cornell NIU imprint, so it's in paperback. So if you want to read that, it's actually out there in paperback, so it's, it's somewhat affordable. Um, but what I want to do, I'm, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this topic because I think the time has come uh, for people to kind of rethink and relearn realism and why it is that realism is a way of thinking worth considering even for people who have a strong moral bent even per, for people like me who tend to, I'm trying to figure out what Christianity is and to take my Christianity seriously. And some people, um, I think, probably think, how can those two things go together? Well, I wanted to start off by a nod to Hans Morgenthau. Um, this is his magnum opus, or maybe not, but it's it's at least his most famous book. It's called Politics Among Nations, and it's an international relations textbook. So I read that, and then I read Scientific Man versus Power Politics, which I loved. I would say that Morgenthau represents old-fashioned realism. Um, and what I mean by that is that another school of thought came along in the 1970s or so. Morgenthau was the earlier generation from the, from the 50s and 60s. That newer generation of realists called themselves neorealists, and they tried to simplify things into just this sort of unidimensional power balance idea, right? That, that all that one needed to understand was kind of the structure of, of power relations and international relations. Whereas old-fashioned realism, such as Morgenthau exemplified, and I believe Thucydides does too, took into account uh, a lot of different uh, variables, including the personality of individual leaders, the character of different nations, but um, what unified the perspective and made it realist was, of course, the accounting for those underlying power relations is very important and generally kind of a pessimistic view about human nature. Uh, Morgenthau wrote in that book, the realist school believes that the world, imperfect as it is from the rational point of view, is the result of forces inherent in human nature. To improve the world, one must work with those forces, not against them. And that right there is the tie to morality. Okay, let me read that again. The realist school believes that the world, imperfect as it is from the rational point of view, is the result of forces inherent in human nature. To improve the world, one must work with those forces, not against them. Morgenthau spent a lot of time uh, against the rationalists. The rationalists thought they could remake the world into a image of their own rational scheme, usually a liberal kind of scheme, where, where the world would be democratic and everybody would have an equal place in it. Um, and, you know, why did he argue against it? Because he just fundamentally believed the world didn't work that way, and as long as people tried to make it work that way, they were going to do more harm than good, okay? So that's why I say down at the bottom there, ideology and even moral claims most often are covers or excuses for underlying power motives, okay? That's what Morgenthau thought. It wasn't that, that Morgenthau or any other realist thought that there's no such thing as morality, but rather that for the most part, when you hear moral claims in international relations as well as national politics, 
you got to be skeptical and you got to think in terms of the possibility anyway that those claims are not genuine and that underneath those claims and stories is actually a, a, a motive to, to grab power, okay? Um, that's just simply being, um, I guess you might say, a bit pessimistic about human nature, a little bit skeptical. But the beginning of wisdom lies in such a mentality, I believe. Okay, so we're not here to talk primarily about Morgenthau, but I wanted to, to get that perspective in there. So, so you kind of know where I'm headed in a way with the overall philosophy. Um, now, um, in the history of the Peloponnesian War, you encounter the Athenian realism, the realism of ancient Athens, um, often referred to as the Athenian thesis, and we're going to take a look at that. But I want to again say that Thucydidean realism is different from Athenian realism. Thucydides, as he analyzes things, does not look at the world the way Athens does, which is very, very simple in a way. Athenian realism is all about basic motivations that are unfortunately for Athens, mixed with a lot of ambition, warlike attitudes, and hubris or pride. And Thucydides shows that these types of admixtures produce a fall in the end for Athens, that they are too warlike, that they're too ambitious, and they have too much pride. Um, so when we study Athens and the way that they look at things, we are not doing the same thing as trying to understand Thucydides because Thucydides' history shows Athens not in its best light, right? And Thucydides um, was at, at times very critical of Athens, you can tell in this history. So just a few words about how Thucydides starts this out. He does what we now call an archaeology. Thucydides' archaeology is his brief accounting of the history of early Greece because he's trying to show that um, the history of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta is well worth a historian spending his time on. He wants to justify why it is that he is going to write this history about the Peloponnesian War. So he says Thucydides, an Athenian, that's him, uh, wrote the history of the, of the war between the Peloponnesians, that's the Spartans, and the Athenians, beginning with the moment that it broke out and believing that it would be a great war and more worthy of relation, of relating it, in other words, than anything that had preceded it, okay? So he wants to say this is the greatest war that's ever been waged, and because it is, he can look at it and he can find a lot of wisdom within it, uh, a wisdom that we can pull out from the mistakes as well as the successes of the parties to the war, okay? So in order to justify that it is the greatest war, he goes back and he does kind of a fairly brief and sweeping view of prior history. And he does a really great job, actually, of surmising from various evidence that's probably still before his eyes uh, that, uh, you know, truly ancient times, ancient to him, were times of relative weakness, okay? He says... You know, as people were relatively undeveloped, uh, there was no settled population way back, right? The people were nomadic, he said. They, they tended to be tribal. Uh, and they did not settle down, so there was no large-scale agriculture. And Thucydides seems to think that it takes that in order to build up a stable, powerful society. Um, he says, clearly, they did not have the ability to navigate over long distances. Their technology was fairly poor before, before in and around the time of the Trojan War, he says. And piracy was common, which inhibited um, travel and commerce. Okay. Um, he says, the Athenians then were the first to lay aside their weapons and to adopt an easier and more luxurious mode of life. So he reckons that they were the first people in Greece to settle down, in other words, to stop that nomadic way of life and to dedicate a good chunk of their population to uh, farming and to building up commerce. Doesn't mean by laying down their weapons, he doesn't mean that they disarm themselves, but rather that they, they, they stop the ultra warlike nature of the tribal on the move society that he thinks they were um, and became settled, 
And in the process then, they were actually able to increase over time their navigation technology um, and increased actually their military might. Um, so they kind of led the way there. They built walls and other cities began and towns began to do the same. There were a lot of walled coastal towns um, and commerce picked up and centers of power formed with Athens being among the chief among them. So there, he, he recounts this consolidation of power into these cities and areas along the coast, okay? And he says, you know, in, in argument as to uh, why this consolidation happened, why the weaker were sort of like um, subsumed under the stronger, it's interesting what he says. And it's indicative of his kind of pessimistic and realistic view of human nature. He says, for the love of gain would reconcile the weaker to the dominion of the stronger, and the possession of capital enabled the more powerful to reduce the smaller towns to subjection. And it was a somewhat later stage of this development uh, um, that they went on the expedition against Troy. So then he discusses the Trojan War a bit. And the Tro Trojan War we now date to around 12th or 11th uh, century BC. Um, he says Agamemnon's navy was the strongest in that war and, quote, fear was quite as strong an element as love in the formation of the Confederate expedition. So why did why did the various cities and peoples follow Agamemnon into battle against Troy out of fear of Agamemnon's power? But the interesting thing about his treatment of the Trojan War is that he's, he expresses skepticism about some of the grander notions that the Greeks believed in regarding that war. He looks on Homer's uh, account of the Trojan War as the account of a poet, which it was, a poet and actually a series of whole lot of poets in an oral tradition, as it turns out, um, that embellished a lot and maybe made up some things. And so he doesn't classify Homer as a historian. And he wants to distinguish what he does from what somebody like Homer did, because Homer dealt in poetry and mythology and, you know, like, for instance, the story of the Trojan horse. Is that actually something that happened? Um, did soldiers leap out of a wooden horse to, like, attack Troy? Um, he's dubious about things like that. So again, he displays this skeptical, kind of rational kernel uh, within his way of thinking, right? He asks questions and he doesn't just revere this event as it is told, okay? Um, and in, then he says the fact that Troy held out for about 10 years is proof that the Hellenic forces were not that strong, or not as strong as they were depicted by the poet. Okay, now he says after the Trojan War, the Spartans gained supremacy in Greece, and that through their military efforts as well as their commercial and, and political activities, they put down many of the tyrannies that had developed in the Greek world. And so they became dominant, okay? Um, and he praises the Spartan government. He, it's an oligarchy. He says it has good laws and enjoyed a freedom from tyrants which was unbroken. It has possessed the same form of government for more than 400 years and has thus been in a position to arrange the affairs of other states. So there we see Thucydides saying, you know, it is a great source of power to have an effective and settled and, you know, well-run government. And Sparta had that before a lot of other cities. And so that enabled it to become dominant and to make over many governments into its image. One of the most interesting things about the history of the Peloponnesian War is that you learn that Sparta as an oligarchy tried to make all of its allies into oligarchies as well. And Athens as a democracy tried to make over its allies and impose democracy upon them. So this is what Sparta um, got up to. Uh, Thucydides then mentions the Battle of Marathon, which was the first attempt of the Persians to conquer the, the Greek world. That happened in 490, and uh, 
the Spartans and the Athenians, but particularly the Athenians, that that battle uh, pushed pushed Persia back. Okay, and, but then Persia came back ten years later, um, and the the uh, ensuing war between Persia and the pretty much completely unified against the Persians Greek world um, was prolonged. We now think uh, various battles in this war ran from 499 to 449 BC. Thucydides says of this war, 10 years later, the barbarian returned with the armada, with the armada for the subjection of Hellas, that's Greece. In the face of this great danger, the command of the Confederate Hellenes was assumed by the Lacedaemonians in virtue of their superior power, and the Athenians, having made up their minds to abandon their city, broke up their homes, threw themselves into their ships, and became a naval people. So this is where Athens becomes a naval power out of necessity, okay, against the Lacedaemonians later on, who were a, a land power. But at this point, they're operating together, but the Athenians become this huge naval force, okay? Um, and notice at the end there the way that he um, depicts the Athenian nature, and that's the way it is throughout. They threw themselves into their ships. They, in, they abandoned their land, and they went to sea, <coughs> and for all these years, you know, poured themselves into this, um, into fighting the Persians as a sea power, okay? Um, and they remained a sea power. So one of the more interesting dynamics of the later war with them and Sparta is that Sparta's strength lays in land power, and Athens' strength lies in naval power. And it's interesting to see how they use these two um, and how, like, the weaknesses of the one and the other play in during different battles. Um, so Thucydides explains that after repulsing the Persians, the barbarian, as he puts it, the coalition, the Hellenic coalition, soon split into two sections. And he treats this as kind of inevitable in a way because they are two different kinds of power, and they're really the two poles in the Hellenic world, the two poles of power, um, the Athenians and the Spartans. He says, for a short time, the league held together till the Lacedaemonians and the Athenians quarreled and made war upon each other with their allies, a duel into which all the Hellenes sooner or later, later were drawn. So that's foreshadowing the war between Athens and Sparta now. He's going to do more. I'm not going to go into everything he does in the way of recounting everything that came before that war. Um, but one thing that you should know is that Athens, with her allies, her empire, really, uh, did things differently than Sparta. Athens um, demanded that her allies disarm, okay? Um, and instead of being armed themselves, they would pay tribute to Athens, and Athens would also demand some of them uh, serve in the Athenian military, okay? And it imposed democracies upon its subject cities, okay? Um, so you have that ideological dimension to the Peloponnesian War, which is just fascinating. If you thought that, you know, only in modern times did people fight partly over, you know, what type of government they were going to impose on on another. Think again. It happened all the way back then. And Sparta, he says, um, did not ask its allies for taxes or tribute, but, quote, merely to secure their subservience to her interests by establishing oligarchies among them. So it imposed a government upon them that was uh, in harmony with its own. Um, but it, when it came to war, it still acted more like an alliance, right? Both powers called what they had alliances, but Athens acted towards her allies more like an imperial dominator, right? Whereas Sparta acted towards her allies more like a chief among them, but an ally, okay? Um, and, and so if uh, Sparta was threatened, it would have to call upon these cities to come to her aid or, um, you know, like cooperate together with their own independent military forces, 
All right, so that's probably enough for one day. And uh, so next time, maybe what I'll do is deal with what started the war. Because uh, in Thucydides' view, Sparta declared war. So it instigated the war at that level. But he also says Athens, through its really, its expansionist um, ambitions and the vast accumulation of its power put Sparta into a position where it felt like it had to declare war and fight back. All right. So both parties, in other words, were responsible for the war in a way. So, but we'll get into that next time. Thank you for listening. I hope that you find this content interesting. If you do, please subscribe to my channel.